this day in history Death is beating, you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive The empty cross, the empty grave Life eternal, you have won the day Shout it out, Jesus is alive He's alive and oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed. everyone. Man, it's good to be here. It's good to see you. Hi to our online audience. We see you. We see you. So real quick, we did make a change and we will be having our kids in um, worship this morning. In first services, we're going to have family in worship K through eight. Um, so please stay and enjoy the worship and then we'll dismiss you to class afterwards. Babies, it's open for babies in the nursery. So just so everybody knows about that, we're gonna have family style worship this morning, right? Awesome. Well, um, I just wanted to share something as we were driving to church this morning. My daughter, who's three, almost four, we um, live kind of out in Enumclaw and so she saw the mountain and she goes, mommy, the mountain is moving because we were driving, right? Like who remembers that as a kid? Like the world is moving. And I was like, well, no, like the mountain's not moving, we're moving. And she's like, oh, no, the mountain's moving. <laughs> she, she was like, I see it with my eyes, mom. And so I just wanted to encourage you today. I, I thought, how many times does our perspective kind of determine what we think about God when really he's immovable, he's unshakable, regardless of our perception, right? Because sometimes we can't always see it. We, we think the mountain's moving. We think, where did your faithfulness go? Where did your steadfastness go? But we can stand on his word 
Lamentations 3.22 that says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So let's remember the faithfulness of the Lord this morning as we enter into worship.
God, all over this place, Father, we lift you high. Father, we lift you up. God, above, your name is above any other name. Father, your ways are higher than our ways. Father, your kingdom is on a different level than where we're at, God, where our minds sometimes are at. And so, Father, we just give you praise today because you are worthy to be praised. Father, we give you praise today for the things that we see that you're doing. But, God, even for those things, for those people that are in between, the things that you've spoken and the things that we, the fulfillment. Father, we give you praise in the in between today. Father, in the, on the valley or on the mountain, we give you praise. In the valley, we give you praise. Father, in the light, we give you praise. And even in the darkness, God, we give you praise. Amen. Amen. He's good. Amen. Amen. Come on. It's good to see you. Come on. God is good. God is faithful. God's kingdom is moving. Amen. Hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to transition. That sounds good. Our worship team, they were on it today. That was awesome. Well, you can go ahead, kids. This is new for us. So as kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, you're going to go with Miss Lynette out this door. In middle school, you guys are going to go out this door. So everyone else, if you're, you know, you're not left out if you're not a kid or a middle schooler, but if you're just in here, you can be seated. You can say hi to someone on your way to your spot, and uh, we're going to continue to do church. Hi. Hey, hey, good morning. It's good to see you. How is 2022 so far? Way cool. Okay, way cool. Come on, sometimes, you know what I'm saying, it's good, right? And sometimes if you think 2021 was bad, then you just got to be like, it only can go up from here, right? So if you're in that camp, right, we're just praying it only can go up from there. And it's good to see, hopefully we didn't have to take any... Uh, you know, boats to church. I think the, the flood waters, hopefully everyone stayed all right through all that. But what crazy times, huh? Crazy times. And the snow, I like it, but we'll see you next time. And that's okay. But it's just good to be in God's house together. Amen? Amen. And we're just glad if you're new today, if this is your first time here, we're just honored that you'd be a part of us. Believe that God has something for his people as we gather. And if you're wondering if you're his people or not, let me just tell you that you are a child of God, yeah. right? You are a son or a daughter of the king. And so um, you may not always feel like his people, but you are a son or a daughter, and that makes you family. And so we're just glad to be together as family today. Let's, I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, we are excited. Um, last week, we kicked off our sermon series for the month of January. We're entitling Pursuit. A month of going after God, a month of intentionally seeking Him, um, and we, you get an invitation today and last week to the journey, and so if you weren't here last week and didn't listen to the message, you're going to just get a little bit more and kind of the invitation of some things that God's doing in us, um, and so I want to just read our theme verse, just going to share for a few minutes today, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 from the Lord a prophecy to his people as they were coming out of a time of captivity, as they were coming out of time of maybe some bondage, maybe you can identify with some of that, um, but we believe as we sang today, right, the darkness will not last very long, right, and so I'm believing that, I'm holding on to that, so Jeremiah starting with verse uh, 12 of 29, it says, then you will call upon me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear you. Come on, God hears our cry. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. 
and I will restore your fortune. That's a good one. Come on. I will restore your fortune and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Come on, I believe this year for many of us can be a year where God is going to break forth in mighty ways in our lives, in our families. Come on, I hope you're expectant for God to break through on your behalf. Anyone with me today? Come on. So I'm going to invite you on a journey. We are today begins our 21 days of prayer and fasting. I'll say it quietly, right? Make it, maybe it'll go over better. No, prayer and fasting before the Lord. And I hope you've taken some time this week to figure out what that means for you, what that looks like. Um, I know for many of you might be doing a meal a day, might be doing a day a week, might be doing a, like a modified fast. Some of you really crazy people might do like a full like week fast or maybe more. Um, whatever God is leading you to do. I know for us, we're doing a few different things with our kids, and I'm doing a few, uh, a few different things throughout the week and certain days of the week. Um, and it's not just abstaining from eating. It'd be praying and seeking the Lord to replace that time that you would be typically shoving your face, right? So we are going to get into the presence of God and pray because I, th- I said it in one of the services, if you're just not eating and not praying, that's called starving. We don't really need to do that. So I hope that you are just uh, going before the Lord. There's lots of ways also to just track daily with what God's doing. We have some prayer focuses Um, You'll get those if you're on our app or social media. So do those things. But here's the goal. Why do we do this? It's not because it's like a secret weight loss plan. No, that's, that's not our thing here. It is the goal of our pursuit is intimacy with God. The goal of our pursuit is to become closer in proximity to where the king is. Amen? We don't want to be far away from the king. We want to be right next to him, right next to his kingdom. Because I just think the closer we are to him, the more victorious of a life that we're going to live. Amen? And so that's the goal of our pursuit. Like Adam in Genesis and way back, it says that Adam walked and talked with God in the cool of the day. Listen, relationship with God is still God's number one goal for your life. Yes, sin, sin makes a mess of things. But God still wants to restore relationship with his creation. And so God wants us to be people who have a relationship, who walk and talk with God uh, in the cool of the day. You know, the Bible says also in Genesis that you and I were made in his image. Right? that's, That's pretty cool. And it's one thing to see God from a distance. Right? Oh, I, I see God over there. I see what he looks like. But when you pursue God and you get closer to God, you see who he is. You see what he's about. I think we're going to do better at becoming more like him the closer we are to him. Right? And so that's the idea of uh, pursuit. Um, it's interesting. Anytime, and you know, some of you might identify with this, but anytime you want to make a positive change in your spiritual life or just in life in general, how many of you know there's always obstacles? Yeah. Right? Always enemies. There's always obstacles. There's always things that want to get in the way of you and the thing that God wants to do in your life. And I want to talk about that today. And, and if I were to title my message, I would call it a familiar foe, right? A familiar enemy, another word. Um, but any time that we step out in faith, the natural reaction to that step of faith is always some form of resistance, It is. I wish it weren't so, but it is. There's enemies, there's obstacles, there's setbacks, those things that come to oppose the preferred future that God has for us. Unfortunately, if you're new to Jesus, if you are just getting to know him as your personal Lord and Savior, I hope you weren't told that coming to Jesus means you will have a perfect life. (laughs) Because that would be called a lie. We don't want to do that. Walking with Jesus does not promise a stress-free 
No worries, no problems for the rest of our day's life. No, it doesn't. It does promise a fulfilled and purposeful life, but it does not promise a problem-free life. I don't know what it is about, my, I'll just pick on myself. Sometimes I think as a preacher, I can be like, sometimes we, right? Well, I'll just speak for myself, right? I don't want to say we because you might be like, that's on you, bro. That's just, you're, you're on your own on this one, right? Sometimes I think I get surprised when there's a setback. It's like, God, you said this, and then it's like, nothing's happening. I'm like, what? What kind of Bible am I reading, right? Because the Bible promises that there will be opposition. So the fact that we have enemies in our life is not unique. But the key is this. The key to defeating our enemies is discerning what is going on and who our enemy is that we're fighting. Because, again, the enemy is not the unique thing, but discernment to defining who our enemy is means everything. You know, our failure to discern the enemy that we're fighting or the obstacle that we're trying to overcome will determine whether or not we will break through or continue to wander around the same mountain over and over again. It's discernment. Because there's lots of different enemies, but you don't want to fight the wrong battle, right? We want to fight the right battle. You know, I've seen many people, and even in my own life, I've stepped out in faith, and things have just gone horrible. Anyone with me? Where you're like, and you ask yourself the question, I must have missed God. Anyone there with me? Where you step out, and you're like, I I swear I heard you, and then it's like, oh, maybe maybe that was the pizza, not God, that I was feeling. I don't know. And so we think we miss God, and so we change course because it seems like that setback was a sign. Listen, setbacks are a sign, but they're not necessarily a sign that we've missed God because discernment is the key to knowing that we're walking in the will of God. So setbacks, yeah, they're a sign, but they may be a sign that you're just heading in the right direction that God has for you. They're a sign that maybe you're making the enemy mad and he wants you to quit, right? So yeah, they are a sign, but it's not always a sign that you think they are. The question to discern is what did God, what did he say, right? You know, I think other times in my life where we want something so bad and we just blame it on God, we're like, this is God and God's up there going like, no, that's, that's what you want. That's not what I want for your life. Right? And that's a dangerous place to be. It, again, discernment to what God is saying is the key to all of this. People will say, well, discernment's a gift, and I just don't have it. Right? Because discernment is one of the spiritual gifts. And I have some great people in my life that walk in the gift of discernment. But I also know that the gift of discernment is also a muscle. Right? Discernment can grow. Discernment can be learned. Discernment can be talked as we walk in proximity with God, that we would be people who understand the times and know what to do. You know, in First Peter, the Bible is very clear that we have an enemy. And one of the enemies that the Bible talks about is the devil. And it says in First Peter that the devil, uh, you know, prances around like a roaring lion seeking those whom he will devour. Right? So we have a very real spiritual enemy called the devil But unfortunately, if I'm just keeping it real today, a lot of times in my life, the enemy, the devil, is not my main problem. Well, see, he's going around like a lion. Of course he's a problem. No, he's a problem. But in fact, most of us, most of the time, are being left alone by the devil. Because we're doing a pretty good job on our own of keeping ourselves off of his hit list. By our sin, by our disobedience, by our walking in the flesh, right? By our lack of faith. The devil doesn't need to attack you if you're not even walking in faith. He's like, hey, thank you. Keep it up. You're doing good. Right? Many of us, man, the devil's not attacking us. We just need to take control of our thought life. 
right? We just need to do what we need to do. You know, the devil doesn't need to attack us because we're already doing a good job of taking ourselves out of the fight, right? The familiar foe, it's not just the devil. It's the same bondage that we've struggled with over and over again. The same sin that, you, you know, you were like when you were 19, you're like, ah, well, the same schemes, the same things, the same doubt that was working 20 years ago, is that still taking us out of the fight today? You know, just physically, right? It's the same issues, the same things in our lives that keep us from living just a less than fulfilled life. I think spiritually we have those same type of things that keep us out. So I want to talk about these enemies. I'm not, not the devil. I want to talk about the familiar enemies that keep us from God. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, a great account of Jesus. Um, I think we can learn a lot from the stories of Jesus. Amen? And so turn in your Bibles. If you don't have a, a paper Bible or your phone, you can check out the screens. And I'm going to read, I'm going to read some, some verses. So hang on. Because we want to identify those things and we want to expose them so they no longer hinder us from what God has. Amen? So a familiar foe. Mark chapter 5, when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, his name was uh, Jairus, by name, and seeing Jesus, Jairus fell at Jesus' feet and implored Jesus earnestly, saying, my daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him, and a great crowd followed and thronged about him. So picture with me, Jesus comes from the other side of the lake where he just performed all these miracles, where he just cast out demons out of these people. He is coming to the boat, and it says that there is a crowd. And so if I picture a crowd, I don't just picture a crowd. I picture that there's also other needs present. Right? So there's a crowd of people, and they're gathering what? Just to be like, there's Jesus. No, they're probably gathering because they have need in their heart. And so this man, Jairus, comes, and he says, I've got need in my my life. My daughter's dying. Will you come? Jesus comes. The first enemy and the first obstacle that I want to talk about is the enemy of comparison. The enemy of comparing your breakthrough to the breakthrough of others. The enemy of comparing your spiritual journey to that of the guy next to you or the gal next to you. Comparison, you know, it's one of those things in our life that will keep us on this never-ending journey of trying to keep up. And I'm not just talking about looks or finances or the car or the, the, you know, the possessions of this world. I'm talking about spiritual comparison. Because here we have this man, Jairus, and this is what comparison says. It says this, I've been waiting in line to see Jesus, and this Jairus guy comes right in, and now Jesus is gone. Hmm. I was here first. I've been a Christian longer. Just because he's a ruler in the synagogue gives him privilege? Huh, Jairus. I don't even know Jerry. I'm mad at him, right? Right, but it's the same thing. It says when we see other people that get their miracle, when we see other people that get their promotion, when we see other people get their marriage fixed and yours is still a mess, and we go, God, why do you love them differently or more than you love me? It's comparison. I've been more faithful than Jarius. I've done more. I've given more than he has. Comparison says, I should be further along by now. You ever thought, and maybe you should. That's the reality. Maybe you should be further along. But when you start to look at other people and say, man, he's sure having a good time in worship today. Like, what's wrong with me? He seems like he feels God. Why don't I feel God? Right? It's comparison. Listen, maybe you should be further along than you are, but don't let that keep you from pursuing 
God with everything in your heart. Comparison causes us to get more concerned with how God is moving in their hearts that we end up missing God wanting to move in our hearts. Right? We get more, oh man, God's doing stuff in them and in our youth and in our kids and in those people and God wants to do great things in your life too if you will just run to him. Comparison causes you to see God breaking through in the lives of others as an interruption to what God should be doing in you. So just in a few moments in our scripture, we see, and I'm, this is, you know, I kind of got the cart before the horse, but we see God, uh, Jesus going with Jairus, and we see on his way to Jairus' daughter, God, Jesus gets interrupted by a woman with an issue. Jarius could have seen that interruption as a distraction to his healing, but God did not see it as an interruption. So sometimes we see that God is trying to do things in our heart, and then we see God doing things in other people, and we think God got interrupted. Listen, God did not get interrupted. God's timing is perfect. Amen? Amen. Let's continue. So the number one enemy, first enemy, comparison. Verse 25, there was a woman, I just told you about her. There was a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, who'd suffered much under many physicians and had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment For she said, if I can just touch his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. The second enemy I want to talk about about to our pursuit is the enemy or obstacle that's filled with fear and doubt that says nothing will ever change. The Bible says that this woman for 12 years, it's a long time, not just a few days, for 12 years she had been to a specialist, meaning she sought it out. She did her homework, right? She did all the things that she needs to do. I've tried fasting before. Nothing changed. I've tried praying before. I fell asleep, right? All those things. I've gone to the prayer summit. I've gone to the conference. You know, I went to church like four times a month for a month. (laughs) Nothing changed. I, I met with the pastor. I met with the counselor, right? She spent her savings, a.k.a. she was broke. I did the whole giving thing. I did the tithing thing. I'm still poor. I tithed, I did that, I obeyed. Listen, the fear says you've been like that for too long. That's just how you are. You just had that issue, lady, with the blood. Deal with it. Stop complaining. Get over it, right? That's what the doubt and the fear says. You've been broken for how long? Your marriage has been a mess since day one, and you think God's going to fix it? Right? The fear, the doubt, the unbelief. The doubt says, you really think that a 21-day fast is going to change anything? Come on, we got to take those things where they belong, right? We got to take that doubt and that fear, and we got to put it back where it came from, not into our hearts and not into our minds. Because here's the truth. The truth is God is the God of the suddenly moment, right? In a moment's notice, God can change everything. If you want to change, no matter how long you've believed the lie, today is the day that God can change everything in your heart. Today could be the day that we say, enough is enough. I need to touch Jesus. The truth is this, that we need to like the woman. It says that she believed the report of Jesus. 
We need to believe the reputation of Jesus more, more than we believe the stronghold of our past. It doesn't matter how strong your issue is. We need to believe the report of Jesus more than our doubts, fears, and unbeliefs. Right? It says she'd heard the report, and so she came. Let's hear the report, and let's come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Romans 10, verse 11 says this. It says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Some translations say, will not be disappointed. My question is, do we believe this or not? It says, everyone that comes will not be disappointed. You will not be disappointed when you come and touch the hem of his garment. When you come into close proximity and say, you are the healer, heal me. Despite her past attempts, right? Despite her failures, despite her efforts, no matter how many times she's tried to fix it, don't let that keep you from touching King Jesus. That second enemy, fear and doubt, that nothing's going to change. Why? So why bother? Let's continue. 30, verse 30. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had gone out from him, immediately turned in the crowd and said, Who touched me? Who touched my garments? His disciples said, uh, they probably said, Jesus, you're crazy because you got like hundreds of people around you. But they said, you see the crowd pressing around you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who done it because Jesus felt power. The third enemy that I want to talk about today is the enemy or the obstacle of the opinions and the rejection of those who watch us draw near to Jesus. It's the opinions and the potential rejections of our friends and our family and those who knew us even before Jesus that keep us from him. Listen, people who, you, who knew you before you met Jesus still have an expectation of your life. They still expect you to be the same person that you've always been, don't they? The same failure, the same sin, the same mess. Listen, Jesus does not leave us where he founds us. He changes us and he transforms us. But there's these expectations of others that we allow to keep us from our journey with him. I was thinking about David, King David in the Old Testament when uh, Samuel the prophet was looking for a king they didn't find their king, and they said, do you have any other sons? Oh, we have David the shepherd boy, right? They counted him out. Even looking at the life and ministry of Jesus, when he went to his hometown, people said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Right? Their expectation was low. Isn't this just the, you know, construction worker's son? No. This is Jesus, the king of kings. You know, this woman with the issue of blood, was known and her rep reputation was that she was unclean because of her issue. She was dirty. She lived a life of isolation and separation because she wasn't accepted to worship at the synagogue. She wasn't accepted to go to the festivals and participate in life because of her issue, condition, she was labeled by society because of what was going on in her, in her body. You know, I don't know what it is about, I probably should just shut my mouth. <sighs> Sometimes I don't do good at that. I don't know what it is about society and humankind, but we always struggle with wanting to separate and segregate people based on some aspect in their life. Might be sin, right? I think in the church we might do that because of sin. Oh, this person's a sinner. Well, aren't we all sinners Amen. saved by grace? Right? So we might do that in the church. We might do that even nationally. We might see that with race issues, the color of skin. 
You know, we might see that today because of choices that you make today with your body, with whether you're going to mask or vax or all the things, right? You're not welcome here. I, I said I shouldn't go there. Sorry. But seriously, I don't know what it is about hum, humanity that says we are going to separate and segregate those who are different than we are. You know, some of us, because of our own condition, have been labeled. Some of us, because others' conditions, have labeled others. But I'm not going to let the opinions of others get in the way of my pursuit with Jesus. Because here's the reality. When she touched Jesus, when she touched his holiness, when she touched his grace, she was changed. Jesus wasn't contaminated by her sickness. Right? G Jesus wasn't afraid, oh, if I touch her, I'm going to bleed. No. <laughs> no. But how many times has our fear from reaching out to others or investing in others, we're afraid that their mess is going to get on us? It's a good question. God is not afraid of your mess. God is not afraid of your sin. God is not afraid of your issue. I think the heart of Jesus says, bring the sick. The heart of Jesus says, bring the broken. The heart of Jesus says, bring the unwell and I will make them well. Not reject the unwell until they're better. <laughs> okay. Bring them to me once they're healed. No, he is the healer. Amen? Amen? So the obstacle of other people's opinions. Verse 33. We've got a little more here. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before Jesus and told him the truth. Right? Can you believe? I touched you. It was, it was me. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The fourth obstacle that keeps us from Jesus that I want to talk about today is the obstacle of exhaustion, of emotional, physical, and financial exhaustion. I'm tired. I'm spent. I don't have anything left within me anymore. Listen, faith will pursue God even in weakness and weariness. You do not have to be strong to go after God. In fact, the Bible says that in our weakness, he is strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says we do not lose heart. Come on, if you're tired, if you're exhausted, don't lose heart. Come on, fellow citizens of Washington, <laughs> come on, don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction. It said light. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look to the things that are seen, not look to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are uh, transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Don't lose heart. You're tired. I'm tired. Everybody's tired. I got a cure for that, and it's not coffee. <laughs> it's, it's not sleep, those, those things may help. It's finding intimacy with Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 12, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more 
gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. I'm going to read that one again. I am content <laughs> with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. Listen, many of us are blinded to God's blessing in our lives because we're living a life of discouragement. His blessing is there. Will you get out of the discouragement? Parents, I wrote this down. I don't know why. Parents, hey, parents, if you have children, part of the plan to overcome your family's discouragement is to uncover your family's inheritance. That is God's plan. You may be discouraged, but will you press through that discouragement to find God's destiny for your family, God's destiny for your kids, God's inheritance for your marriage? That's pretty good. You are the one that can unblock, unlock the blessing of God for your family. You are the one. You are the one that is called to bring breakthrough to your marriage. Bring what you have. Well, I don't have enough. I don't care. Bring what you have and let God bless it. So the obstacle, right, exhaustion, tiredness, come on. Those are the familiar foes, aren't they? I'm tired. I am too. Right? Familiar foe. Let's press through. All right. We're going to continue. Verse 35. While he was still speaking. So are you tracking with what happened? Jairus goes. Jesus gets interrupted. A woman touches him. Jesus stops. Woman gets healed. Jairus is still there going, my daughter's like sick. Don't forget about her. Okay, that's, that's the story. While he was still speaking, someone came from Jairus' house and said, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Why trouble Jesus any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to Jairus, do not fear, only believe. So can you imagine the disappointment for a minute? If that woman wouldn't have come to Jesus, he would have gotten there on time. The next obstacle or enemy that we need to fight today is the enemy that says God's delay is God's denial. Listen, just because you haven't seen it in the time you want to see it does not mean that God is done. God's delay is not his denial. Second Peter chapter 3 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. But he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. Listen, because you haven't seen it yet, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't say God's not faithful. Because I'm sure Jairus could have said, this man's a fraud. And, and, and Jesus said this to him, don't fear, believe. Have faith. Don't lose heart. God's delay is not his denial. Verse 37, let's continue. And he allowed, this is interesting, he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, Jesus saw a commotion. People were weeping and wailing because a, a, a young daughter had just died and they were wailing loudly. When he heard, when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? That's pretty insensitive, Jesus. Right? This girl just died. The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was, taking her by the hand, 
he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. Wow. Hidden point, don't laugh at God. Okay, that's, I, I hope you saw that. Don't, don't do that. But the next, the last obstacle I want to talk about, and I'm going to have our worship team come forward. Yes, I am. The obstacle, the enemy of having the wrong people in your life versus the right people. You've got to have the right voices in your life and the wrong voices out of your life. We, we say this, and it's, you know, scripture that says bad company corrupts good morals. Parents, we know that one, right? Get good friends. Okay, that's the friend verse. But listen, doubt, negativity, and unbelief kills a spirit of faith. And when you need a breakthrough from God, sometimes you've got to silence those voices that are full of unbelief, that are full of doubt. And you see, he didn't bring everyone with him to the house. He brought... Peter or James, John, I don't remember, right? You can, you, you can read it. James, Peter, James, and John. He didn't bring everyone. And then once he got there, he left them all outside. Why? I don't know. Other than he wanted people of faith that can believe for what he wanted to do in that girl's life. So sometimes, I'm not saying we got to cut people out of our lives, but sometimes we gotta, we got to put that voice where it belongs and say, hey, I appreciate what you're saying, but I'm going to believe what God says. Ugh. Yeah. Because Jesus wanted to do the miracle, and there was good, well-meaning people. And sometimes we got to get those voices out of the forefront so that we can hear his voice. Hey, let's stand. We're going to sing, and we're going to declare some things in the short time we have together. But how many of you can just be honest this morning and say, hey, I can identify with one, at least one of these obstacles, with one of these foes, right? Can we say maybe today is the day that we're going to get rid of that foe forever. We're going to believe and trust God at his word to break through in the areas that he wants to break through in. Amen? So let me pray. Jesus, thank you that you are the way maker, that you are the one who breaks chains, that you are the one who, who does impossible things. Father, we know we have many enemies, and many of those familiar foes have been with us forever. And God, I pray today that you would intervene on our behalf. Father, you know the obstacle. You know the enemy that we fight. You know the ones that we struggle with in this room. It might be doubt, it might be exhaustion, it might be unbelief, it might be the voices that we've allowed to have influence in our lives. God, you know. And Father, today I pray, Father, that we would push past those enemies to get to you, to get our breakthrough, to get our healing. God, in your presence today, would you do a mighty work in our hearts. Father, for those that don't know you, that today would be the day that they push through their mess, their shame, their condemnation to get to Jesus. And Father, I hear you say, come. God, would we come to you? Amen. Amen? Come on, let's, let's sing this out. Let's declare this in his presence.
Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our online audience for joining us. If you are new, there are several ways to stay connected. First of all, we have a church app, so you can download the church app. You can also visit the church website and sign up for our newsletter. It's weekly. It'll keep you up to speed with all you need to know. And if you are new here in the building, would you please fill out one of the cards on the back of the chair in front of you? You can drop that in the black box in the back. That'll help us be able to get you in the loop with all that's going on here. So thank you so much. If you want to know more about starting that relationship with Jesus that Pastor Justin talked about, we have a gift for you in the back in the Connect Corner and would love to just chat with you and get you connected. So please do that. Um, prayer team, will you come forward? If you need prayer today, we would love to pray for you, specifically with that message. If anything kind of hit home and you need someone to walk with you through that to encourage you, we would love to pray for you. Or for any other reason, if you need prayer, please come forward so we can be a family and pray for you today. Three ways to give. You can give online at genhope.org. You can text 84321, or you can place your offering in that same black box in the back. All right of announcements. So today begins our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Join us as we embark on our 21 day journey of corporate prayer and fasting with the purpose of seeking God, his will and his power for this year. So that's January 9th through the 29th. Um, pursuit prayer and worship nights. So during our 21 day fast, we're gonna be having pursuit nights every Thursday night. So please come to those. It's gonna be a great time, an hour of corporate prayer and worship. So that's gonna start this Thursday. Let's pack the house. Let's, let's really um, commit ourselves to this fast and to experiencing the Lord in these times through those pursuit nights. It's gonna be a great time. So Thursday the 13th, then the 20th, that's in the 27th at 6.30 p.m. Next, we're going to do water baptisms. So that's going to be Sunday, January 23rd. So please let us know if you or your child want to be baptized. Um, you can sign up on the church website or you can talk to a leader and we will help you with that. 
And lastly, our GHC Annual Vision Sunday is going to be January 30th. So we'll be sharing GHC's year in review for 2021, all the great things that happened, and new vision and direction for 2022. So make sure to mark that on your calendar, not to miss that service. So thank you so much. Have a great sunny Sunday. Go and be blessed.